Hi, my friends. Hope you're doing well. This is Dr. Lee, and I am here today with a very special guest. Her name is Eleanor Beaton, and she is a an educator and a coach and a power person. That's that's how I'm going to put this. She is someone who has made it her mission to have gender equity in the workplace and in the marketplace and in business. And she is guiding women on that journey and sharing her wisdom, the wisdom that she's gathered over the years in her journey. I can't wait to hear Eleanor's story. I can't wait to introduce her to you. Thank you, Eleanor, for being here. I'm so honored to be here with you and your audience. So let's get going and let's start out with perhaps what was the original spark that made you interested in gender equity and Mm -hmm. finding that parity and creating a path for women to really be successful in the marketplace? The spark was my mother's indignation and frustration one day driving me to basketball practice. <laughs> Literally, it was that. So I um, grew up you know, in Eastern Canada. We are immigrants. My mother is from the Fiji Islands. My father was Welsh. We moved here for my dad to be a prof at this university in the town that I still live in, in fact. And so my mom comes here, I was born already, and it's a completely different culture. She was a black woman, comes from the Fiji Islands. Nobody here looks like her. The culture is different. And so she decided that she really didn't feel comfortable putting me in childcare, so she stayed at home. And this was a woman who had been the main breadwinner in my parents' relationship before that. So my dad... Um, he works full time for 18 years. My mom stayed at home with me and my then my sister and brother. And so my parents had this great relationship in many ways. But because my mom didn't make money, she became financially disempowered. And so when she wanted to do certain things with the family finances, like become an investor, my father, who was very risk intolerant, was like, oh, I don't want to do that. And because she didn't have her own money, She wasn't able to have the same kind of influence. And I can remember her driving me to basketball practice one day. They'd had a disagreement about how to spend the money. And she said, Eleanor, money is power. Always make sure that you have your own. And it was so that moment, even when I think about it today, like I feel the fire in my belly from her. I feel the generational fire from so many women who have been economically disempowered and therefore didn't have choice. And that fire has been burning the whole time, you know, and has really been kind of a fuel that has guided the development of my career and of my business and really of me as a woman. What a fascinating story and a story of just of cultures and immigration and disempowerment, a process of disempowerment that you saw. What did you, what was your reaction after your mother told you that? What, what, was it fear? Was it? You know, this was, was my, this is, nobody's ever asked me this question, but as soon as you asked me, I knew exactly what happened. It was a split. And I felt, and this was what I made that mean. This is in my sort of 15-year-old brain. I was like, well, I'm never going to be like you. That's, that's what I said to myself. And it's so painful to say this now. It's so painful. And that's what disempowerment can do. Like when you're raised in a culture of disempowerment as a kid, you want to align with the power, not with the disempowered you know? So the first thing that happened was I was, you know, in my mind, I literally, like, I loved my mom so much, but I didn't want to be like her. So over the next, honestly, like 10, 15 years, it was this systematic not being like my mom. You know, it was a systematic, definitely being much more over in my masculine energy, um, definitely following, it, you know, asking my dad for a lot of guidance. Um, I really sort of, you know, built up, tried to climb the corporate ladder, 
and, um, you know, really pursued success by being things that my mom wasn't. So I was always, had always been interested in personal development, but, uh, and it's funny because it's a huge part of what I do today is, you know, holistic coaching that looks not just at the woman founder, but at her as a leader. But, you know, I didn't want to have my work be anything about that. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So the first thing was this split. And on the, the other part of it, though, was just this fierce determination to be independent. So it was like this one-two punch of the desire for independence that my mom really tried to instill in me combined with the, I don't want to be like you. I had to do a lot of work around that. <laughs> yes. And I feel like this this may not be where we thought this conversation was going, but <laughs> but that I feel like in my own education about psychology, sexual development, <laughs> that there is a forced separation of the daughter. Yeah. Uh, well, actually from both the daughters and the sons from the mother away from the mother, but that the, the, the daughters never really have to go quite as far, but I love in your story how you knew that your goal was to feel and be independent. And in order to do that, you had to radically move away from whatever you thought your mother represented. But that comes at a, at a cost to the connection, to the relationships, to the feminine self, I'm thinking. And it sounds like you've done <laughs> all the work backwards and forwards to bring this into a whole identity so that you could use it for your work. Yeah. And it's interesting that, you know, um, the way that I have, that I arrived at that work that we're discussing here, it was always through creativity. So I arrived at it sideways all the time. So I'll give you an example. I was in my, so I was in my thirties and I decided, you know, I've been a writer my whole life. Um, writing is a huge part of what I do. So I decided, you know what, I have, I have this novel that's sort of half completed. I think I'm going to do a master's in fine art in creative writing as one does. And so, you know, I have my two sons. I'm, look, uh, husband, I'm leaving for two weeks to go to my residency at my MFA. Like this is the phase of life that I was in. So I'm working on it. And as part of that, I'm researching story structure. Because anybody who's tried to write a novel, it's all about the story. And I just felt like I couldn't pull the story together. So my prof, we're talking about the hero's journey, which is a really ancient form of storytelling. The hero, it's like the Bible, it's Avatar, it's Gilgamesh, like all the old stories. So the hero, there's a hero, um, he is called to do something. Either there's an internal call or there's an external call. He goes and he, and he faces a series of obstacles, each obstacle bigger than the one before. And each obstacle challenges him to be bigger and better until the final obstacle, which he overcomes and gets either what he wants or what he needs, the end. So as I'm doing this Masters of Fine Art, trying to figure out how the hell I tell this coming of age story about a woman, my prof says, you know what? you should check out the heroine's journey. And so the heroine's journey created by, you know, documented by Maureen Murdoch, who was the psychologist in the 1970s in California. She is a student of Joseph Campbell's, who was the mythologist who created the hero's journey. And she says to him, you know, it's interesting. When I think about the women that I work with, this hero's journey, their experience in coming of age doesn't match this. And he's like, no, because for in the heroine's journey, the true journey comes. It's like we do the hero's journey first. We go out into the world and we get the things and we arrive at that pinnacle and we're like, this is it? Really? <laughs> you know? And then it's all about the return. It's the descent into the dark feminine. It's like really going back into ourselves to discover who are we really. So that separation, when I look back in it, that's what I see. That was me separating from my mom and femininity and really moving much more to conventional success, to the path. And all of that is fine and good. Like I loved that, all of that, it helped me be a better person. I learned incredible skills, but ultimately in order to be a whole person, you know, in order to be truly, like I was burning out all the time. 
um, in order to really be able to bring my full self to work, I had to unite with this part of me that I think I really chose to step away from at the age of 14 when I looked at my mom and I said, thank you for the advice. I'm going to use it and I don't want to be like you. Mm -hmm. So what is the heroine's journey now that you've been (laughs) on it and can can reflect backwards? Mm. What for you was the difference in terms of the, the woman's path? Yeah. So there's, yeah, and I think that there's the there's the the sort of classic heroine's journey. It's a book by Maureen Murdoch, and a lot of uh, sort of study into this that I suggest people check out. For me, um, you know, when I look at the heroine's journey, so when I growing up, I really was always looking to others for the path and the answers. And I definitely think as, you know, in part of my development, that sort of mentorship and apprenticeship, like every time I'm learning how to do something new, I go and look at what elders are doing or people who, they don't have to be older than me. They just, they know. And so that's a very valuable part of handing down knowledge. But, you know, I think the big thing for me was um, becoming attuning more to my own soul and to my own wisdom and trusting and and listening to that first before and over and above listening to other people or what expectations were or even sometimes what my intellect said so you know one of i would say that one of the biggest the sort of big kind of um, evolution for me in terms of really integrating this practice into my life was you know i became a coach And a lot of, it's interesting that a lot of the coaching model is very, it can trace its lineage, you know, to Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And that very much of the coaching model, which is very useful and helpful, and I still use it, which is that, you know, there's circumstances which create thoughts, which create feelings, which create action, and your point of power is always in the thought, which is very Rene Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. So what was happening is that I was coaching myself all the time. If I had a thought like, this is scary, you know what I mean? Or this is dangerous. And I would start coaching myself out of it. And that was helpful to a place. But I still felt, I guess I can say it was like this split where I still would feel like I was kind of forcing myself or faking it, (laughs) you know, to get myself to take massive action or whatever. So then I started, you know, under the guidance of a great teacher called Hiro Boga, I really became a lot more interested in this practice of wholeness. And so what would happen is rather than coach, trying to label things as things as thoughts or gremlins or whatever, I would say to myself, I would experience something like I would hear myself saying something like this, you better hurry up. Like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta handle this quickly. We've got to get on this. It was this energy of we've got to. And rather than being like, that's a limiting thought, I would step back and I would really ask myself, who's saying that? And sometimes it was like my mom or my dad, you know, and my voice, like metaphorically, but often it was me. It was like 14 year old Eleanor. Interestingly, the same age as the girl who was like, I don't want to be like you, mom. But that same girl who was like, in order to be safe, you have to hustle. In order to be worth it, you need to be actioning everything. And so when I would try to coach myself out of limiting thoughts, what I was essentially saying to that version of who I am, that 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 14-year-old who still lives within me, I was basically saying to her, hey, shut up. Your voice is not important. It's just a limiting thought. And that's what I was doing. So I was using coaching against myself. And so for me, like a huge wholeness practice and that ability to bring in the feminine has been to connect with these earlier versions of myself and really connect, love them and say things like, okay, what, you know, tell me what's going on with you. So for instance, she comes out anytime I'm taking, I'm growing. She thinks that we need, that's her response. And I just talked to her. I'm like, you know what? I love your energy. I need you with me. I can tell that this is making you feel like you need to do. And you know what? Bring your energy, but you're not responsible for running this business. And you're welcome and included here. Like it's, 
I'm literally talking to myself, you know, a lot, but there is a feeling of groundedness now, you know, that it has been very powerful um, for me. And I, I talk about this as often as I can, because it's been so profound for me that I, I just want, you know, I think it's, it could be useful to other people. Yes. Thank you. You speak so beautifully and you bring in so many different powerful (laughs) elements about a woman's journey, really, and from your own journey. And one thing that I hear is that you are radically accepting all the different parts and flavors and experiences that might be in a moment of growth. That might be the terror. That might be the self-doubt. That might be the, oh boy, you better hold on another (laughs) six weeks before you decide that you have developed a mastery and a calmness about the complexity of you and your history and your goals and the power that you have right now. It makes me curious, this is tangential, what mm-hmm. your mother is like personality wise, yeah. kind of, is she grounded? I mean, she did give you that advice, right? And I, yeah. I think like other mothers might not have shared that kind of wisdom or mm-hmm. cared enough, that kind of a thing. What have you found you've pulled from your mother's personality and enjoyed yeah. now that you've kind of reflected in this way? Oh my gosh, like uh, so much. You know, and that's the, that's the ironic thing. Yeah. So, you know, my mother, um, is incredibly adaptable and independent, um, optimistic and open-minded. So really up for things. Um, she is an athlete. (laughs) He still is like, she's too busy. It's hilarious. I have a younger brother who's 12 years younger and he has like two kids who are like four months and, and like two. And my mom is not always available to babysit as much as he would like because she plays pickleball six days per week. It's hilarious. Like, it's really, really funny. But it's also, I think what I've pulled from my mom, you know, through all of the things that she experienced being a black woman with a full Afro in this rural white town, the things that she experienced, like, you know, um, and just was always this sort of um, straight-backed, big-haired uh, emblem to me of 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 just um, elegance and uh, dignity, you know. And I think these are things that her example, you know, I've really pulled from her. And in fact, one of my favorite activities to do with my mom, I would come home from school and we would watch Oprah Winfrey. And so that's where I learned about Martha Beck. It's where I learned about Dr. Phil, Ian Van Zant, Gary Zirko, the seat of the soul guy. Like, I mean, honestly, and the hilarious thing is that now these, well, not all of them, but some of them are like my heroes, you know? So the reality is my mom was a much more influential shaper of who I am in some ways than my dad was. Um, and you know, yeah, I've, I've pulled so much from her and I'm I'm so grateful to her and also for the strength that it must have taken to be in a culture and a patriarchal culture and also a racist culture, you know, where you raise these beings who don't want to be like you where there's a, there's a rite of passage that we go through that we don't want to be like you. And this was beyond, right? Like, you know, I think about that and I'm so incredibly grateful for her grace through all of those things. Again, you speak so beautifully and you're making me want to cry. <laughs> and I'm not crying. I'm cry too. I know. Here we go. Here we go. I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit because we were talking about how you can now connect with the earlier versions of yourself, not reject parts of yourself. And the thought that I had about that is that requires calmness and in many ways, a lack of anxiety. And I'm thinking about perhaps the modern woman's experience, whether she's a business owner, a go-getter or not, that there is this kind of pandemic of anxiety too, not just for women, but we're talking about women today. Mm -hmm. And what you needed to do to kind of understand your own patterns of anxiety 
and your suggestions to our audience and anybody who's listening for if you're wanting to coach yourself, develop yourself, calm, calm yourself down so that you can enjoy your life more, what tips would you have or what reflections would you have? For me, it's certainly been um, like an evolution. So initially, it was very much about you know coaching and understanding thinking and understanding I'm not my thoughts. I can separate from my thoughts. That I can choose my thoughts. You know, and so that was really this one level. And I think for many people, if you haven't had the gift of that type of work, even before coaching, it was like therapy. So I was in therapy and, and learning about you know cognitive behavioral therapy and learning about that and then moving into coaching and learning about coaching and getting coached. And then, you know, this wholeness practice, but I would say at this level for me, and I suspect that many of your listeners probably have also are also, because this is a show about personal development. So they've also probably been on this path with you and I for several years now, maybe more. And, you know, I think for me, the thing that I have learned that has been this next evolution of transformation is understanding energy, like really understanding. And people would talk about energy and I would be like, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, I don't know. We're in Canada. So I was like, I don't know what they're smoking. It could be, you know, like it could be something. <laughs> so this would happen. I didn't understand or appreciate, but what would happen? And I'll give you an example. So one time I was sitting around a boardroom table and I, um, something was happening that I disagreed with deeply and I said it and, you know, anybody who sat around these boardroom tables, um, and you dissent, it's hard to do. And so I disagreed and all of a sudden I felt this, I felt frozen, you know, and I hadn't felt this before. I felt totally frozen. And I realized, you know, after I was like, why did this happen? Like, even as I was trying to coach myself and for days after I felt this weight around me for dissenting around something. And I realized afterward, it was an energy thing that there was all this energy from people. It was like energy against, I was, you know, the only woman at that table the energy of decades, hundred centuries of, you know, of women not having voices of, and, and I know there are going to be people who are listening to this who are like, what is she talking about? And I'm just like, just wait. Cause one day, you know, it's like when you learn the language of energy. And so what happened is, you know, I actually didn't have the skills to be able to protect myself energetically, you know, to be able to understand when in my area is like energy, negative energy or other people's energy or energy that has nothing to do with me. I didn't know how to process that, how to determine what's my energy, what's somebody else's energy, how to just release some, I don't have to process anybody else's energy just to release it. So I think, you know, really energy workers and like finding some good ones who understand, like, again, I love the work of Hero Boga. Um, like understanding the, you know, tr energy workers, how to work with energy has been the next evolution in my personal development to keep me grounded and present. And when I can do that, I feel that I'm able to operate in a way that is true to me. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm a big energy talker. Are you? And yeah, right? Because not everybody is. And then like I used to be like, what is going and now I'm I'm all about it. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah. I think I knew it as a little kid and didn't talk about it like energy, but I was yes. always sensing the thing around the corner and yeah. that, that was just always part of me. And it now makes so much more sense to me now that people are speaking in this language in different ways. And it, you might call it, our, for our audience, you might call it something else other than energy. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're sharing today is about the impact we have on each other, not just with words and not just with thoughts, but just with our being and our intention yeah. and all of these things that we can't see that we're, I think, many people are beginning to speak about more actively. And of course, it's, we're not new at this, but there's a whole new language and um, 
<laughs> uh, influencers and leaders yeah. that you can follow to learn about how do you open up your own energy for more. And Who's your for- favorite person on this? Because I'm always so it, – because it's new. Like this is one of those areas where I'm like, I want to learn more about it. Well, I have to tell you, inst- I think I'm going to opt, instead of telling you about a person, yeah. I think I'm just going to talk about being a psychologist because yeah. every single person I work with has a very different energy. And so hour to hour, I'm shifting zones of energy within myself to match in some way, loosely speaking, not be the person's complete opposite energy in that hour is important. And it is work. (laughs) It is work because as I've grown in entrepreneurship and in my own development, my own energy is going in different ways. And sometimes therapy is a fit. Sometimes it's less of a fit these days because my mind is on growth all the time and expansion. And sometimes that's not what is needed for the patient, but that's the work of therapy. And I do that carefully. And I learn from that too. I grow Mm. within each session so many decades. (laughs) Yeah. After so many decades of doing this, it still is a growth venture because you understand the person more deeply And in some ways, they understand you and your energy more deeply, too. So I think I've been forced by nature of my chosen profession to really sink into what is them, what is me, what is my option here. And I see so many different options because in some way, as a coach or a therapist, part of your valuable role is to be able to hold open the door for all the other possibilities Mm -hmm. that are there that maybe neither of us can see, but you know what? The door is open. And I remember learning in a couple's therapy training that it's the couple's therapist's role to hold the possibility of the couple's survival as a possibility. And I really thought that was just about the best piece of that's beautiful training I could get. Cause I didn't really, <laughs> I was yeah. shying away. I was really running away from couples therapy. I thought it was <laughs> complex. I thought it was messy. Right. And it is, it, it, it is. is complex yeah. and messy. <laughs> but I thought, Oh, what a nice template yeah. to work from that. All I have to do is think, Oh, wow. Could this really work? Maybe this could work. Maybe they could stay together. Maybe they could find new parts of themselves and each other and their relationship to work with each other. And actually working with couples is pretty fun too, yeah, yeah, <laughs> because yeah. you get you, the spark and the woman. energy. You brave woman. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, thank you. So I'm inspired by my clients. I'm, I'm inspired by also my colleagues in entrepreneurship, people, mm-hmm. men and women who are creating from scratch, who are spending the extra hours, who are digging deep into their own hero or heroine's journey and not backing down because there's so many different opportunities where you should and could and, and might, but that we fight that instinct in some ways, because there's a broader goal of getting the message out, getting the products out, serving the right people, serving more people. And it's really fun too. I don't mean to say, wow, this, <laughs> the hero has fun too. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. A lot of fun. The hero and heroine gets to have fun for sure. Yeah. And yeah. I learned from honestly, my podcast guests. So thank you mm-hmm. for being one of these people that I'm learning so much from. And and I learn about communication and satisfaction and topics. It's all over the place. And it's so fun. Yeah, yeah it, it really is. So I want to switch topics again and talk about what you're doing with your clients right now. Mm your goal, your large goal, your 
your big, big, big goal, um, if you could state it here and kind of what you envision for yourself and your business for the next few years. Mm, okay. So um, my vision is truly to advance a model of economic growth that nourishes the planet, one woman owned business at a time. And this goes back as well, you know, as much as sort of feminism and the empowerment of women and women leaders has been so key to my being for such a long time, so has the planet, you know, so has the planet. And it's interesting, you know, like I have seen and watched, you know, like the climate change talks um, and I see how these, you know, world leaders who say that we really care, who understand that the science is fairly defi- definite, you know, about what's happening with respect to climate change, and they still don't really act as decisively as we might like. And they're not stupid, irrational people. And I don't think it's just that they're power hungry either. I think it's that as a world, we still don't really believe that you can have economic growth without harm to the planet, to people, to habitats. And I refuse to believe that's true. I just refuse. And so I really see that women founders have an opportunity to to shape the future of business and what it looks like. So the vision is a true vision for me Christine, I hope you're there with me. I I see myself as a collective with a group of women founders and we go to the UN and we are just bringing in, I don't know if you saw Miracle on 34th Street when they're bringing in the letters to Santa Claus. Anybody who's seen that movie, there's like <laughs> loads and loads and loads of letters to Santa Claus. And I see that loads and loads and loads of case studies of women founders who have built businesses that have scaled past a million, have had a diverse supply chain, build these incredible teams where people that, you know, where it's a workplace culture defined by well-being, contribute tens of millions to the tax base every year and have done it sustainably. And we go to the UN and we say, economic growth that nourishes the planet is possible. We are a collective case study of how to do that. And we would love for you to learn from our experiences so that these can be rolled out across, you know, across the world to really change our economic growth model. So that's the vision. And so then it's like, how do I do that? Like, how would I actually have people listen rather than just be like, well, there's a crackpot and a do-gooder. And it's by, if we are able to double the number of women founders who sustainably scale past a million. So that mission is real and it's, I'm looking for the proof point. So when I think about the business, so my business is all about helping women owned founders scale past a million. And we have, I serve founders who run service-based businesses. They are psychologists, they are consultants, they are DEI practitioners, um, they are architects, (laughs) you know, they are HR professionals, recruiters. So, you know, it's really about what I do when I think about marketing, I, th- I think about sharing the message. And I also think about where are these women who are going to come with me to the UN? Literally, that's how I think about it. <laughs> and right. And then I also work on the consulting side, like really consulting with governments and NGOs and banks to be like, what are you doing? to elevate the number of women founders who sustainably scale, right? So everything that happens in our business is mission-based, but to stay in, you know, and then, so that's like the big vision. And then to really bring it in, the mechanism is a dual business. So you scale sustainably, 30% top line growth, 30% profitability, 30% open time. So I help uh, women founders build dual businesses. And the first place is to really simplify our companies to stop being addicted to growth through complexity, but really see simplicity as the most powerful growth tool there is. And so at that's the level. So typically I'm working with women founders who are doing six, like our specialty is taking them from six to seven figures. There's, it's what gets you to six figures is very different than what gets you to a million. And then after the million, it's a totally different story again. So that's the place that I've chosen. I'm so passionate about the work and everything in the business is reverse engineered from that vision from being in the room, bringing in all of the like, you know, in case study after case study and all of the women. And we are just a wall of well-dressed 
beautifully turned out evidence of what sustainable economic growth looks like. I love it. It's a beautiful vision, a viable vision for the future. I think it's a vision that is happening um, of, of women caring, women sharing, women collaborating, and women making the impact at the scale that you're envisioning. And I thank yeah. you f- for being a colleague and for being a leader and for being someone who does the work and shows up and does all the episodes and does all the meet and greets and does all the dissenting so that your vision can can thrive. Um, I can't wait for those in our audience who need to to connect you. Could you please share with us what's the best and easiest way for people to start working with you, keep following you, et cetera? Yeah. So I think probably over on Instagram, Eleanor Beaton, um, and there's my podcast, Power Presence Position. Those are two places that I think are a great place to start. Terrific. Eleanor's podcast is fantastic. She just hit 500 episodes, which (laughs) is is a heroine's journey (laughs) in itself. So it congratulations has there. Uh, and you. Eleanor, thank you so much for being here today with me and for sharing your thoughts, your brilliance, and your vision. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everyone. I will see you next Thursday when the next episode of the Make Time for Success podcast drops. Take care until then.